Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. My name is Fred Valles, and I'm your host. Um, so we have a topic today that's a, um, a second half, basically, a follow-up on a topic we did uh, about eight sessions ago. It was video ads, and we had two great speakers. We had Joe Martinez and Corey Hank. And uh, we, we just kept on talking about video ads, and uh, we went into a lot of detail, a lot of best practices, a lot of tips, so much so that the audience said, hey, can we uh, continue doing a little bit more of this? Because that one hour really wasn't enough. So that's exactly what we're doing today. We're going to talk more about video ads and try to go even deeper than we did last time. But the whole goal of this is let's make it really tactical. Let's give you very specific advice. And let's make sure that if you spend an hour with us today, you get something out of it that you can apply to your business and your advertising right away. So with that, let's go and talk about video ads. All right, and we're back. So uh, we're supposed to have two speakers, like I said, Corey and Joe, but uh, we can't find Corey. So Joe, <laughs> might just uh, be you and me today. Hey, it's a little one-on-one -on -one fireside chat. We'll keep it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I just wish I knew more about video ads, uh, <laughs> Corey not being here. But you know, it's not that different from PPC, right? Yeah, you know, it's exactly the same as search, right? Yeah, exactly. Don't quote me on that. Hey, hey, no. <laughs> Yeah, you know, slightly different way of targeting, but at least bidding is the same. Budgets yeah. are the same. Yeah, it's. I mean, if it's familiar with Google Ads. It's you know, it's, in terms of if we're talking about just YouTube video campaigns, um, you know, it's something that I have enjoyed a lot more. To me, it's it's much more fun to work with visuals, and I look at it as like, how would I rather watch a video or read a blog? I think anything with video is much more entertaining, and I can get a lot of. I think valuable engagement metrics from there that can actually help search campaigns and any other marketing efforts that you're doing. Okay, we definitely got to talk about that then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the creative, how you put something together that's really visually appealing and how you then leverage the insights you get from that to really understand what your audience is thinking and, and how to optimize from that. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So my company, Optimizer, obviously, we're really into optimization. But when we think about that, it's often very metrics driven. It sounds like when it comes to video, it's maybe more on a, a personal engagement level. So that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I think it's it's easier just with, you know, you get how many characters in a text ad to say what you want. You can still trigger emotions with a text ad. You definitely can do that, especially if you're layering on audiences and you knowing ex exactly what type of demographic that you're targeting. But, you know, with a video ad testing, we could show those emotions. You know, we could, it's, it's something as subtle as the music that you add on to an ad or a video can change how a person feels. And it's that kind of playing around and testing um, that I love. I came from a, a, a broadcasting background. So I was, you know, I started out doing writing, you know, radio commercials and that type of thing. So it's the sounds and how the actor uh, portrays those sounds of what they're saying in the text and in some music that's different. Um, and then I kind of worked at a, a branding agency where they did a lot of video and we did some cool branding. So that's where my love of video really started from. Yeah. And, and, and tell us a little bit more about who you are, your expertise in this and, uh, and uh, clicks marketing, the firm that you work with. Yeah. Before we judge uh, deep, deep dive into all of these topics. Yeah, no, thank you for letting me do that because I forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm over laughs> uh, I am the director of client strategy at uh, Clicks Marketing. I've only been there for about uh, a year, God, October will be two years already. That, that's that gone by fast. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I've been uh, in paid media for about nine years now. Uh, before I was in paid media, I worked at uh, Kohl's corporate headquarters outside of uh, Milwaukee. So I, I had some real you know, retail and then that's where I got my bug into e-commerce and that's how it kind of slowly transitioned into the, the digital world. Just funny because I don't do a ton of e-commerce anymore. Um, but I think that you saw it from, I see the line on the bottom that I have a, a radio background. So I think it's, um, I love doing the talking and speaking like this, but anything with like brand awareness and just getting a voice out there has always been intriguing to me. So um, I love to focus on YouTube and display and awareness campaigns and brand building. Nice. And uh, you're sitting in that beautiful studio because you were a former radio DJ. So you know how to. Yeah, it's, started, right? it's still probably a little echoey because if I look down, it's still like pure concrete floors. This is like my yeah. dad and I, my dad and I built a safe space 
in my unfinished basement because you know when I took the job at Clicks, I was like, oh yeah, it's 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 a remote job. I was like, I don't have an office at home because I've always worked at an agency in a location. Right. I was like, mm. I didn't I didn't have an office space ready, so I just had to build one simple and this is pretty cheap. <laughs> and these days we all work from home. And uh, uh, I think is it Marco joining us from Ireland? <coughs> Elbow cough. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for joining us. Uh, anyone else who wants to tell us where they're calling in from, go ahead and do that. And of course, uh, we would love to take questions. So uh, you know, Joe has really deep expertise in video ads. If there's anything you want him to elaborate on or anything you're curious about, um, just go ahead and put that into the chat comments and we'll try to bring it up. Um, as a topic we talk about. But Joe, one of the things you were mentioning um, was the engaging content, right? And I think maybe one of the things with video is how do you even get started? I mean, like when it comes to a text ad, I can crank out a text ad in 30 seconds. Um, how long does it take to make a video ad and how do you go about it? Yeah, there are a, a few different ways that we've tried it. Um, I, I don't know if I honestly don't remember if we talked about it last time, but I think we did. There's the, the video builder tool. Uh, that was really new, I think, last time, right? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of just released, and that is an option. It's not going to be the option for everybody because there are specific templates um, depending on what type of video you want to run. Um, and you can customize them to a certain point, but it's one of those things where if you really don't have any budget for video or you know your company has an allotted budget for video or you're a really small business and you don't want to hire someone it's a good tool to at least test it and try it out um you when you're creating that video template you can save it you can create you can edit it and create multiple versions and that's kind of what i've got those going to of testing different music testing a different intro a different color or something just see what triggers people's engagement responses if you see any improvement from it and you could save it automatically to your channel unlisted if you want to and you can automatically create video campaigns from the tool itself and so for the, the people maybe more used to text ads it sounds a little bit like a responsive search ad where you put together a bunch of components a responsive display ad. Yes. Yeah. And Google just combines them. Yep. Yeah. Depending on what template it is, if it is just more branding, um, if it is, there is options for e-commerce. So you can showcase certain products. So if you do one that's product focused, and then they're going to go through, you know, three, four different products, you're going to need a mul multiple images for each product. You need the title or and the price of what you want those products to be. So kind of exactly what you said. Yeah. It, it is kind of that. Template. Does that come directly out of your merchant feed or do you have to submit it separately? That is manually entered. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can go in preview. Opportunity. Yes. <laughs> you can go in, um, when I first started playing around with it, that's what it was. I mean, it's only been a couple months. I doubt that they've really updated it. But yeah, you can go within the template and be like, I like how this one looks. And then it'll say you need these many images, this size, you'll need this, these many titles. So it gives you everything so you can prep ahead of time and then when you're ready go back and start building it nice and then how does the report the, the reports look because i know what rsa is on the text side um they tell you some of the combinations of how things have been put together mm -hmm. but they really still don't do the best job in the world of uh kind of highlighting okay this headline did this well and, and so in your example if you had different images so how do you find out which images are working or which music is working best with, with the video builder tool it's not um, it, it, the ad format itself, you have to create the video and save it as a separate video on right. on YouTube first. So you're still uploading a s individual video. If you're just naming your videos differently, it's all going to be a different one. It's technically not an ad format within the channel. Okay. So they help you generate actual videos and each one of these becomes the video ad. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you You have to save it to your YouTube channel before you can even use it. Got it. And then what is your strategy in terms of how many variations will you run? Uh, I like to look at it specifically on what type of budget the client has. And if it's one, if, if it's branding, there's a few different ways that we could test it out. I think how many uh, asset variants that they have too, in terms of what images we can use or right, that I can get from them to put within the ads. If you don't want to use stock photography, um, I'd like to keep it to around two or three to test. If it is a broader audience, like if I'm doing just a basic topic and I know I'm not going to have any issues like reaching a, a maximum cap on that. Then I might test out, you know, four or five different variants. But in terms of the creative, I like to keep it as a couple first, because if I'm doing any sort of call to action extension on top of that, I also like to test my call to action extensions too. So I don't want to have too many variants that I'm testing at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you uh, found like anything, 
any component that just seems to have more of an impact than the others? So CPA, music, images? To me, it's it's that message that first five seconds. What What is the narrator, or what is the, the character or the actor saying within the first five seconds that's going to, you know, if I'm like people like me who listen to like YouTube off to the side with music or anything while I'm working, it was, if I hear something, you know, what's that first five seconds that's going to trigger me to actually pay attention uh -huh. to the ad. So I, that message is going to be extremely uh, important. Um, something that I think is a little bit more difficult with the video builder tool is your logo is not always showing up every time. And I think that is from an in-stream perspective, that is extremely important where if they are paying attention, if they skip it, they at least see your brand name right away. Um, so that's where sometimes we've shifted to other tools. I have a client that uses promo.com. That's another template tool. And that goes beyond just YouTube. You can create video templates for Instagram, Facebook, um, and a variety of other channels in different formats and kind of meet the specs for each of those channels. That one's just not, there it is. Yeah. It's just not a YouTube ads platform. And, you can see it in the background. Those are examples of like the stock video footage that you can use. Uh, we have a lot of SaaS clients at Clicks, and you think like, I probably can't find something that works. It's like, well, we look at what industry this SaaS client is targeting, and we try to find videos related to that industry. And there's there's some good ones. I mean, there's some that are like, yeah, it, it's clear it's, it's stock video footage, but then there's some, it's just like, it looks like a normal commercial shoot. So we just kind of keep our eyes open. If we see anyone else using anything remotely close to it, we try to switch it up so it looks unique to us mm -hmm. or that company. And then the other interesting point you sort of uh, brought up is you're sitting there working and you got YouTube playing in the background. Uh, and I guess uh, you just uh, music videos or? Yeah, I, I listen yeah. to full albums. Full uh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. It's so just, they're, they're um, to, to what I mean, you said in the first five seconds, so important, right? But yeah, put your logo in, but someone like you, you might not even pay attention to the logo. It's really, it's like, is that five second commercial? Is that catchy? So, I mean, we're talking here about video ads, but really you're talking about radio ads almost. Yes. In this scenario, right? Yes, absolutely. That, that's when, when all these voice assistants were starting to pop up. I was like, I got excited. I was like, here we go. Radio ads. This is what I went to school for. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't really panned out exactly what I wanted, but um, yeah, no, it, it's the exact same thing. So sometimes we have, you know, are you, in, oh, let, how can brand X, you know, I can't say a company name, how can brand X help you with, you know, tossing that so it at least captures some sort of trigger and awareness that will get the user to engage with the ad. Exactly. Um, here, I want to show something else on screen for a minute. Um, not really video advertising per se, but, uh, you know, let's have fun with this conversation. So this was an announcement from Google that you can now query or you can ask questions to BigQuery uh, using this natural voice um, system that they have. Um, and so BigQuery is a great place to put all your uh, your marketing data, including your Google Ads data. And, uh, and so they've written this Q&A bot. So you can literally ask questions like, how many orders did I get for a specific product? <laughs> and uh, you don't have to build a SQL-like query. You just ask natural language queries. And it uh, tries to figure out from your data set what the answer to that is. Um, oh. so that's another really fascinating way that we've seen in the last week or so um, of using voice. I'm just looking specifically at everything you have on your sheet. Also. Yeah, so Joe's intrigued. So yeah, so <laughs> they're intrigued too. Um, yeah, so we'll put the blog post in the show notes. But this is an announcement from Google. Um, so yeah, July 8th. So it's, it's about a month old at this point. But, uh, but really cool technology. And like you were talking about the voice assistants, right? So one thing that's really cool about the voice assistants is that they're so good at interpreting questions. Now, one thing that amazes me, by the way, is like I have a, an 18 month old daughter and uh, she goes up to the, dev the device and she, she wants it to show her albums. And like most humans who visit our house, um, the few that actually are allowed during COVID, they, uh, they don't understand what she's saying, but after three months of her screaming at the voice assistant, the voice assistant <laughs> does exactly what she wants. <laughs> well, see, it's gonna, my kids kind of have a little flip of that. Like we watch a lot of, you know, funny videos, kid appropriate, of course, um, on YouTube at night. We always mm -hmm. have like dance parties. We watch, you know, some funny Star Wars videos and stuff like that. So then they, sometimes they've walked up to the TV and say, YouTube, find Star Wars bad lip reading. 
and they'll say that like straight to the TV thing, like, no, doesn't work that way. We don't, we don't have that smart of a team. Our team is a little bit older, but they're so used to getting that information right away, um, which, which has been kind of funny for them to see. I think actually my daughter might be upstairs watching the live stream right now on YouTube. Oh, nice. Hello, your daughter. <laughs> um, so we got a question here from Ryan. Uh, Google Rep has advised us not to exclude certain YouTube ad placements. Well, what do you think about that? I don't feel like advertising on Daddy Yankee or Bad Bunny videos is appealing to a 35 plus audience. <laughs> I kind of agree with you, Ryan. It doesn't seem appealing, but what do you think, Joe? Not to exclude, like, are they saying like ever? Like, don't exclude placements ever? I mean, if you're doing audience targeting, that's fine. If you, I've used this phrase a lot, like, if you have a Coca Cola budget and everyone in the world almost likes Coca Cola, that's one thing. You know, if you have a limited budget, and you have a specific goal in mind with that campaign, it's always important to be optimizing to whatever is working. Um, well, I don't to talk about audience for a second, right? Because I think you're hitting on something there. So I'm assuming these are uh, it, it's channels for like children, right? So you're not supposed to have a YouTube account if you're less under 13 years old. So a lot of young people probably use their parents' account. Yep. I think what Ryan might be getting at is that, yeah, listen, it might be Fred's account that seems to really enjoy watching daddy yankee and we're trying to target him with some ads about like maybe a new car uh, but in reality it's probably going to be fred's children who are watching this so can we actually trust audience signals at that point yeah yeah if it's i look at particularly of you know it, do you want your content shown on that channel um we have seen people have converted from a music channel because we're focusing on a very specific custom intent audience that we've created. Now, like, now if they were looking for a specific SaaS product on Google, we're targeting that audience. We're not targeting that placement or that channel or that video. So the user could still be interested in my product. It's just, look at what I watch YouTube. You saw on the bottom, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. I have other interests. I like to buy other things, but I'm gonna be on Star Wars videos a lot on YouTube. I still could be interested in your products. It's just, this is what I'm doing for fun at night. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it depends on what your audience target is. And that's hard without seeing, you know, exactly what you're targeting, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're purposely targeting those specific channels. So I think that's why being proactive, if you feel your audience isn't on, you know, the daddy Yankee, bad bunny channels. Um, I mean, I'm Puerto Rican, so I like both of them, uh, <laughs> but it, then, then block them out. And you can do that proactively. You don't have to wait till they show up until your placement reports. Um, and there's a lot of, list out there. I created one for the kids exclusion list. Uh, Sear has another one for the kids exclusion list. And there's other lists out there where you can find a list of YouTube channels for a different for a variety of different genres and proactively exclude them if you don't want your ad showing up there. You do have that control. And I don't care what the Google rep says. If you don't want your videos on there, it's your brand. You can protect it, whatever you want. Block it out if you want to. Yeah, don't always trust a rep, right? We'll yeah. show that list of uh, YouTube exclusions here in a minute. But uh, I believe we have somebody who just joined us. So uh... Corey, welcome to hey the guys. Call. Hey, you? buddy. <laughs> hey, can you hear me okay? Is everything good? Do I look all right? Oh, man, sorry. I had a little emergency this morning. I'm here. I apologize. Oh, no worries. Hope uh, life is good. You. Yeah, I hope it's uh, good. not too bad. Good. Well, thanks for joining us. So, uh, yeah, we're just uh, catching up here on a lot of video-related stuff, but tell the audience real quick who you are, how long you've been doing video, uh, sure. and we'll get back into the topics. Hi, I'm Corey Hinky, and um, you know we started Variable Media, a um, YouTube-focused Facebook agency, about three and a half years ago here in Utah. Um, I've worked on a lot of great videos. I think the biggest one that we've worked on was the, uh, the um, Purple Mattress Goldilocks. I think everybody knows that one, but that was the one that kind of you know helped us grow and um, you know be the agency that we are today. So I've been primarily focused on YouTube, speaking with, you know, Joe and a lot of different conferences. I think, um, you know, having these platforms to be able to discuss video is great. And um, I think, uh, you know, how more people into this here. Hey, Corey, your, uh, your internet's not great. <laughs> You're cutting in and out a bit there. But uh, maybe we'll give you a minute to, to push the yeah. button on the router. And, uh, and we'll talk to you again in a minute. Uh, but it's great to have you on the call and hope everything's all right. So um, let's go back to the comments, actually, and some of the questions. So there was another question from Marco. 
Um, so he ran a true view campaign that did really well, but was cut short several days, uh, not spending the budget. No, this is actually one of the topics we had wanted to discuss was, um, you know, how do you scale on YouTube, right? So it seems like there's so many video views, but then people at the same time still have a hard time actually spending as much money as they want to when it uh, when it's working well. Yeah, I, I have never ran into the issue of, I, I guess it depends on... <laughs> <laughs> I saw, I saw my, my daughter's commenting. She's only in second grade. Well, thanks for watching, sweetie. Um, looking specifically from, I'm going to try not to laugh now. Um, uh, specifically from a TV only campaign, I would say it depends on what targeting option you're using. And I wouldn't give up on that one yet. It, even if your targeting is very specific, keep watching because every single month I see that percentage of videos being watched on TV increasing more and more. Again, I think would go back to looking specifically at how that initial targeting option is. If it is just like a remarketing audience and you're keeping that audience pretty tight, um, you may have more trouble there. But in looking, you know, looking back at it, I think more and more we, we're getting, I'm personally, my accounts are getting a lot of video views from TV. And honestly, in terms of the percentage that they're watching it, TV is actually the number one of the most watch time that we're getting and game consoles have been number two. Um, so that is particularly what I'm seeing. Um, if your targeting is specific, I would just maybe try to expand it out a little bit and seeing if you're, if, if that can help you get the exposure that you want on TV. Corey, what do you think? See, last time my internet cut out. Yeah, exactly. And this time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how is it that you two are the most popular uh, that we've ever had on the show and we can never cut the internet? <laughs> Good at YouTube, not the IT to set the YouTube up. So. <laughs> uh, hey, Corey, maybe, maybe turn off your. Uh, actually, I don't think you can turn off your video on this thing. How about now? Can you hear it? Now we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, guys. Oh, man. This is rough. But on TV, on YouTube, man, it's really exciting. You know, I was excited probably about two months ago to see the fact that we were able to just segment, you know, just for TV. But I think this is going to be the comparison against CTV as well as, you know, something new that, you know, I'm learning about in the past couple of months, which is just a self serve Google, right? And I think that comparison between moving around YouTube TV, CTV, and Hulu, getting all those three screens on the biggest screen in the house, I think is going to give us such a really good comparison from a CPM standpoint. I still really like skippable video even on YouTube because from what I'm seeing in the data, we're finding that users still skip on the TV somehow. And so, you know, smart TVs have unique capabilities, not every TV is the same. But um, it's very interesting data that we are seeing in TV, and I really like the comparison to CTV. And the more platforms that I think that we see go self-serve, I think only increases the work for a media buyer. But from a data standpoint, it's a really good comparison across the board. Right, so you're talking about all these new platforms, kind of, uh, and that's the solution then to spending more budget, right? If you have a video ad, campaign that seems to be working well, how do you find new channels to maybe push it onto if for whatever reason you've tapped out on YouTube? Um, any thoughts on, so I think Hulu is a fairly new one there that's uh, doing soft serve. Yeah. About that. Something that made me think of, sorry, going back to the previous question that we had that just popped in my head, there is a, because TV is getting more popular with YouTube, in the placements targeting options of your ad group, there is a fairly newer placement targeting option called video lineups because people are watching more YouTube videos on TV devices. So you can target, I think it's just worldwide, you can target whatever's popular on YouTube at the time with your video ad. My son just walked in, of course. Buddy, close the door. <laughs> <laughs> One said, oh, man, cool. this is funny. You got to leave, okay? I love you so much, <laughs> but go away. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there are certain genres. If you want to target people who are just looking at game console uh, 
videos. You can target that one. There's a variety of different cooking genres on YouTube that you can target now. And it's all broken out by a lot of different countries too. So even how we can target our videos on YouTube with TV is going to be improved to match the TV viewership that we're seeing. Um, but I know it, we've looked into in Hulu of what we can do. Um, that is something we keep our eyes on. Send out one form to RSVP to get into that beta. Um, I just know if you're interested in doing anything with Hulu, there is a $5 minimum per campaign. So that's something if you are a little bit budget conscious, you know, Hulu may not be the best fit for you, but I, and you also cannot target by specific TV shows. It is genre of TV shows you can do in specific interest. Um, I don't know, Corey, if you've gotten into that one yet or not. No, we haven't actually, you know, had access to the data yet to really, you know, dive into the self serve. I'm just more, you know, interested in terms of, you know, what we can see. But to your point on, you know, just YouTube and the wide variety of countries, videos, et cetera, I think, you know, I agree with you. And I think it's even cheaper when you go outside the U.S., which allows you to get more views, test more, and learn, I think, a little bit faster. But, you know, the majority of my clients don't have a huge international presence. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that we're finding on, on YouTube from a data side, too, is just the ability to, to see the difference between how people convert, you know, when that YouTube is embedded, when that, when that video is embedded on a website versus, you know, on the YouTube platform. And I think that's another, you know, great indicator, very similar to, you know, country and video that you're, um, that you're at, that, that you're at in front of. Yeah, let's, uh. Sorry, Corey, I'm having a, a hell of a time understanding you. <laughs> really? Fantastic advice in there. Um, but I want to go back to one thing. So uh, just before you came in, Joe was actually talking about a kid's YouTube exclusion list. And I did want to show that on screen here for just a second, um, as well as give you all the URL to that. All right. So um, so I guess if we start breaking down how to be how to be like a master of video ads, level one is like just go on YouTube, right? create the, uh, the, the video ads using all the tools that they have available, um, do a bunch of different tests, and then start looking at the metrics. And based on those metrics, you might want to do some exclusions um, and those metrics and performance-driven exclusions. But at the same time, it sounds like also you want to preventatively set up some exclusions based on things you think may not work well. In this case, we have a list of uh, children's uh, channels. And there might be other lists of channels out there as well. And do you guys have any other favorite lists of exclusions? Uh, particularly with lists, no. Uh, I mean, I know Sear. Sear has another one that they have a larger data set than I do. I think Sear made one that might be almost five thousand. So uh, I'm sure a good amount of the ones I have on mine could be in theirs as well. Um, I also wrote a post recently for WordStream that just talked about understanding how placements work for YouTube campaigns. Um, and that one is, because you can target websites, but if you're targeting websites on the display network, YouTube or Google can still show your ad on relative channels and, and vice versa. So if you're still showing your video on specific uh, placements on YouTube, they could show up on the display network and vice versa. So sometimes what you think you're targeting from a placement specific campaign may not always be where your ads are always showing. So you can try to be as proactive as possible, but you really have to understand how the settings for these things actually work because it's like match types, right? It's not as exact as we think they are all the time. And that's why we could see a lot of placements that we don't want showing up in our reports. Right, so you see on the screen here for the people watching the video stream, um, this is the SEER blog post that they analyzed 331,000 sites. Um, oh, and I'm showing the wrong link now, but that's the link right there. And they find 165,000 placements to negate. By the way, what is the placement exclusion limit in Google? Can you just upload 165K? You know what? My answer to that one is I don't know offhand. <laughs> Yeah, I know like for keywords, the limits are pretty high, like around 10 million or something. Yeah. As far as placements, I'm, I'm not like, and I know negative targeting is uh, a little bit more limited for sure. So anyway, so that's another good list there that you can use. Um, okay, so now we've built our campaigns, we've done metrics exclusion, we've gotten these uh, category-based exclusions that we don't think work well. And then that next stage is going into expanding our reach by testing out some new platforms. And so we're talking about Hulu, we're talking about 
um, IGTV. Actually, we haven't talked much about IGTV. So, Corey, is that a topic um, you want to tell us a bit about? So, IGTV, um, Instagram. I'd, I'd love to, and I hope my audio holds up, Fred. And so, if it if it cuts out again, um, really bad. I'm just going to, you know, exit and restart. But does it sound okay so far? It's passable. <laughs> That's it's passable. I'll just make you big on screen so people can try to read your lips. Okay. So I'm go so sorry. Um, here's what we're seeing on IGTV is that when we think about Instagram, the areas that are promotable when it comes to video are, you know, stories as well as the news feed. So you have to pay to advertise in those areas. It seems like the areas that you don't have to advertise for, which also include video, are um, where you can't advertise for is um, IGTV um, reels as well as live. And so that's where you know we believe we're getting the most organic reach with our video is in that IGTV. And so the big trouble with that IGTV is how to promote it. Right, is that if you create great long form on Instagram, you put it in IGTV, how do I really get people to see it? And I think that's one of the most difficult things with long form video on Instagram. And so we've kind of we've kind of taken two different angles to be able to promote that video. And so the first angle, which doesn't help your view count on Instagram, is to take that long form and run it inside the Facebook newsfeed, just the Facebook, you know, post to be able to get to see how people react to long form inside the inside the feed, which would be the Facebook, you know, feed. And the other way to really um, drive up Instagram um, IGTV views would be to take that IGTV and embed it on a web page. And so, um, thank you for that note, Corey. <laughs> Great name too. Um, and so if you take the IGTV and you embed it on a web page, that is a great way to then, you know, drive up the views of that IGTV. Um, and you can also, you know, send users from a URL standpoint to Instagram slash, you know, whatever that handle is slash channel. And that puts them, you know, right on the IGTV from a, from, um, from a desktop perspective. So, you know, we play around with things in the, um, in the um, news feed with, with, with URLs and sending users directly to long form with like watch now as a call to action and then leveraging that Instagram URL as I, um, as I explained. All right. Joe, any thoughts on that? No, yeah, I haven't really messed with Instagram TV at all. So I was actually looking forward to see what Corey said about it. Yeah, so it's it's interesting that they do really well there with the uh, the long form educational content. Um, I'm actually curious, like, so so a company like Optimizer, we don't typically think about B two B as something we would want to advertise on Instagram or even TikTok. But then I hear buzz that yeah, maybe we should be doing things there. Is that what do you think about that? I think for for any advertiser and especially b2b it's like where do i spend my time you know and when i think about somebody holding that mobile device where and and, and, and ingesting like long form it has to be i think very important to them i think people can easily ingest long form on like youtube and so you know for optimizer i think youtube is going to be you know that place that they will see probably you know, the most impact from long form. But, you know, that's not to say that, you know, you couldn't find, you know, potential value on Instagram. I just think that the way that I know Instagram is from brands that do e-commerce, have a huge audience, you know, on Instagram. And so you're talking about with people that have, you know, 250 followers, 250 thousand followers, you know, or more. And so we don't have that you know, and you don't see necessarily the returns, you know, immediately, like, you know, is it, does it cause you to not necessarily invest that time and effort into long form next time, right? I think, um, you know, building up a YouTube channel is still the better place for long form if you're gonna focus on it. And what we've seen from B2B and, you know, a few of our SaaS or lead gen clients too is the long form and just the true view discovery ad format. And that has honestly become one of my favorite ones, just because we've had uh, clients who they've had webinars or seminars and they're like, this is great. You know, we got really good engagement, good signups. It's, you know, hour, hour and a half webinar. And then they're like, well, now we really can't do anything with it. I was like, well, if people, if people are searching 
for this content or educational topics on YouTube, we can target just the search results with discovery ads and really showcase that. Again, it's from brand building. You know, We can't add a call to action extension or a lead gen form to a discovery campaign, but it's getting them engaged with your brand and then using that watch time and that engagement to hoping they subscribe to the channel and then we can remarket to them in other ways and just other ways that they have interacted with us to just introduce them so they even know you exist. Yeah. And, and, and that's the other point too, when you compare those two like long form platforms like YouTube versus IGTV is, is right to Joe's point of, you have so many opportunities to um, capture different aspects of the audience. Like you can segment subscribers versus people who have liked. You can't necessarily do that in IGTV. And so you're so much limited in terms of, I think what you can learn, the data that you get back as well as you know being able to target specific users. I still think there's so much more advantages on YouTube currently. Okay, so then we got another audience question here. So Rebecca's asking, what are some of the main metrics that you will use to you optimize video campaigns? Um, saying that sometimes it's a little difficult to prove the value beyond just the view rates and earned actions when the client is actually very uh, you know, lead gen focused. Maybe you could talk about lead forms at this point, but uh, before I, we jump into that, what's kind of a, what do you think for Rebecca here? I can, uh, I, I can take a shot at this, uh, this question. Um, I think what main metrics we use, especially with lead forms, is um, you know we focus on CPC because you know the CPC for a lead form is very different. It's like not them going to the website; it's them engaging with that lead form. And so, you know, that really shows us, you know, the impact of how engaging it is, especially if we don't have a lot of lead flow, right? And so we use that to kind of say like, okay, let's test a couple of audiences and then let's focus on that CPC. Um, I think another thing that you should do when focusing on the CPC or some, or some of these upper funnel metrics that you mentioned, like view rate and reviews, I think those are great to look at, um, is also, you know, testing your bid type. We think that that is like one of the biggest variables that you can look at, like target CPA versus maximize conversions. And um, that is a great way, I think, to potentially find some more um, lead volume that could help you decide what audience works better. But I would look at the engagement with the lead form. And then I think one thing you should definitely test is, um, and that's unique to YouTube, especially the lead form, is the call to action. You can play with that call to action with the amount of um, characters in that limit. And so being able to use things like, Fill out today, right? Fill out now. You know, maybe it's one of those pieces, but there's a lot of different um, aspects of the lead form that you can change and then test. But I would focus on the CPC if you're not finding that, you know, using view rate, CPM, and earned view is a great indicator. Yeah, one thing that we have done is at least just to cover your bases, create a an audience in the audience manager of anyone who's watched your video as an ad within the past 540 days and add it as a optimization, you know, bid only audience to every single one of your search campaigns. That's something that we've gone back to see, if, okay, they have seen a video ad, then they go back and convert. So that's one way that we keep an eye on it. And just depending on what volume, again, for search, so that audience needs about a thousand active users every 30 days for it to be eligible to at least show the data within our search campaigns but create as deep as video viewer audiences as you can, just to see how it's impacting people's search behavior. Um, one thing that we always do is we adjust our columns as well. We look at view through conversions and cross device conversions of, you know, are these leading to those eventual metrics as well? Again, people are there to, people go to YouTube to watch videos. That's pretty much the only thing you can do there. They're not there for your white paper. They're not there for your demo. So again, I hope it to use it as to plant a seed. Lead forms are perfect for collecting that information. We try to keep them as short as possible and having it be as auto-filled as possible, again, so they can get back to why they were there in the first place was not to interact with your ad to watch the video. So we wanna make it as easy for users as possible. And sometimes, I, I don't wanna say this term, Frederick, because we've joked about this so many times, but focusing on that, that micro conversion. We're not asking for that demo or that free trial right away. You know, we're, we're asking for something, just their email, just to get them interested. And we've used that before because clients say email works really well for us. So, okay, fine. Let's use YouTube to build up your email because you know you have such high conversion rates from your email marketing campaign and all your other branding efforts. So it's 
shifting like what mindset people are in on YouTube. You know, ne even if it is a custom intent audience, which can be pretty specific, it's still not search. Their intent at that moment was not to look up something, it was to watch a video. So we, we've shifted our call to action and what we want that user to do. It's not the deepest form of conversion that we're trying to get them to do typically with search. It is something gonna be something higher level and that's where we see a better impact. Brian, that's where we've made it so difficult for ourselves in the last 20 years of PPC advertising of saying like, it's all about the lead, it's all about the sale, right? Last click attribution. And I mean, meanwhile, for a hundred years before that, we've been doing traditional marketing where maybe it was a bit more about branding and putting your name top of mind when somebody is actually looking for the thing that you sell and, and being okay with that, not necessarily being directly equatable to the, the sale. Um, and so that, that's what the, the role that YouTube plays, right? Is just stay top of mind, be out yeah. uh, and also be helpful. I mean, like, and that's the thing on YouTube with this long form content, it's such a great place to share your advice and hey, why are the two of you on this call today, right? It's because you're gonna get long-term benefit of these guys know what they're doing when it comes to video advertising. And at some point, somebody's gonna need some help and who's gonna be top of mind? Well, the folks who have been doing these types of things. So. It doesn't have to directly equate to a lead. But how do you go into the C-suite, right? How do you go to your boss and your manager? Like, I even and So, Corey, I know you're your own boss. But, Joe, I think you have a boss, right? I do. So how do you justify spending an hour of your time with me here? Uh, I mean, you, you pretty much explained it. You know, it's the payoff. It's the people reaching out after the fact. Like, I'll still have people being like, yeah, I, I read that blog you wrote and I was like which one they say it I was like I think it's like two years old but yeah. like you never know when some of those things you know pay off it, it is that awareness and um you know something depending on what the product is you know there's a lot of products that aren't just a $12 t-shirt that's more of an impulse buy and you can easily do that you know look at what product you were selling uh you know clients who you know you're, you're trying to sell a, a a SaaS product that's you know going to eventually cost them, you know, five to 10 grand a month, you know, I'll go up to that C-suite or boss and be like, Hey, you're seeing me the first time. Give me $5,000. And they look, <laughs> they look at you weird and they're like, Oh, okay. Well, that's what you're doing to your potential customers right now. Why the hell should they sign up right away when you don't want people doing it to you, but you want to do it to everybody else. It's just think of that experience of how you would feel if that's happening to you. And that can change the C-suite mindset of like, Oh yeah, I, I typically don't just drop you know five to ten k without even thinking about it whatsoever. So that's where it kind of we we really push the nurture part of it, right? And, and I think at some level, people also want to kind of know who they're doing business with, right? I mean, so you may say it's five thousand dollars, and the the offering looks good, but at this point now, they've gotten some of your personality. They kind of know what you stand for. They uh. They know you love your child dearly, even though you had to kick him out of your office, right? I mean, they, 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 they go on mute, yell at him, and get, get out. So. <laughs> that makes it personal. People do want to do business with folks that they think are, you know, in some way like them, and that they think who they think will treat them well if things don't go well. Um, and that's also the reality of business, right? Like, it's there are going to be tough times in any business relationship, and it's really about understanding how will that person behave under pressure, under stress. Um, and I think that sort of personality can come out in video materials that we do. There's one other point. Um, so I was talking to some of the Hennepin folks, uh, another big agency, and, and they were saying that in months where they see a lot of webinars and a lot of webinar signups, they can't directly core uh, or equate it to new customers, but they do see that that tends to be a leading indicator of the business growing. Um, right, and it's an, it's another one of these educational things where it's not about asking for the sale on the spot. It's not asking for the actual um, the, the the lead to come in, but uh, but it does work, right? And I think we can think about YouTube in some sort of the same way. Yeah, and, and, and kind of going back to like the brands you trust too. It's, I mean, we we legit love talking about this. Like mm -hmm. all the three of us have been at conferences before. Remember those things, um, and, and like. <laughs> Yes, we talk about our, our personal lives and other stuff, but like we legit, when we get together, we we nerd out, nerd, nerd out about all this paid media stuff mm -hmm. all the time because we legit love it. And I think if if you're passionate about what you do, and we're talking about paid media because that's what we do, but whatever product you're selling, you know, if you're truly being honest and it's it's clear that you know 
you care about what your product that you're selling it and that comes across in your ads, especially your video ads, I, it can help people fall in love with you. You know, people are going to buy from brands that they trust and they can personally connect with. And the more that we can show that within our ads or any of the marketing efforts that we do, you will see that payoff. Yeah. Hey, so uh, shifting topics a little bit here. So finding people who are likable, who they will trust, like how do you go about finding maybe new partners and channels to, uh, to put your ads next to? And does that even matter? Or do you just like straight up care about audience no matter what channel they might be on? I, I think we have to look at, you know, Google, YouTube and their properties as some of like the best targeting that we can find on the planet right now. And so I don't think that influencers and channel specific like partnerships are extremely important. Does it work if it is a, you know, direct correlation? You sell something in the fitness space, you found the, first, you found the best fitness influencer on YouTube who already did a video about you organically, right? Seems like a great partnership to make, but I don't think it's necessary. Joe, what do you think? Yeah, it, looking at specific influencers, you know, we've had ones where our clients have already done, you know, the persona research on, you know, flat out asking, you know, their, their current customers and, and getting that information. Um, you know, what we've done from, you know, looking at specific uh, channels and everything to do it, we have looked uh, within YouTube Studio and just see from, either external via websites or where have our natural organic video ads being shared from, whether it's, it could be an external website, it could be other playlists on YouTube and using that information to do like, does that person have an, an influence and is it something that we would want to potentially partner with? Um, there is a ton of valuable information on placements within YouTube studio. Um, or YouTube analytics, depending on what, what you're used to calling it. Um, that is something where we have researched on the organic reach and how is that organic reach and who's sharing it? How can that make an impact on how we market with ads later on? Yeah, and if I could only add to that, I think, um, you know, the placement report, like if you go to the, the placement report in, um, in YouTube and you've got enough conversions to really you know, look at the placements and decide, okay, these are a lot of conversions that have come from this channel. I mean, that's a great way, you know, to find the right influencer. I can think of a, um, I'd say a health brand that we were working with, just opening up through YouTube and seeing the placement report, we saw a lot of conversions on like um, yoga, you know, like yoga, health. And so like a yoga influencer who does yoga, you can see probably putting out consistent content. Where could I probably, where can I potentially do my product placement, you know, during that long form yoga session. You can start to think about things like that before you even reach out and it literally have a plan for them what you want. And I think that, you know, could potentially help the situation, but the opportunity is there. I just don't think that is necessary you know, if you want to jump in and start there. Well, let's uh, shift topics here one more time. So Corey, you hosted a PPC chat less than a month ago. I um, wanted to ask you how that went. And whenever I go to PPC chat, I always find out interesting stuff because uh, for, for those of you not familiar with the format, it's basically on Twitter, uh, hashtag PPC chat. I believe it's uh, Tuesdays at nine o'clock Pacific every week. And there's a different host comes in with about, you know, five to 10 questions. And then the, uh, the audience participates and gives their take on stuff. And so you hosted one on video ads. Um, how did it go? And like, what was your biggest takeaway? Um, PPC chat is always amazing. I think um, we are all so thankful for this community. You know, it's absolutely great. I think, you know, the big thing I learned and I always do learn, and I think Joe might be the same, is how much people are really yearning for video, like, you know, um, just answers, answers to YouTube content. I don't feel like there are a lot of influencers or, you know, people in the space really talking about video. And I, and I wish a lot of more people would, but I think that was the biggest thing is just, you know, trying to educate. And, you know, we dealt with some of the questions that we felt today, which is just like, you know, what are the most important metrics to look at? You know, like that question there, like what was the biggest hurdle for your brand, you know, to use YouTube? And so a lot of, you know, introductory questions to YouTube, nothing necessarily in depth, but how much in depth can you go with just text on Twitter? <laughs> um, so, but again, it's always a great conversation and we, we always have a fun time. Like, let's maybe look at this question, Fred. Do you have a funnel audience strategy when testing your YouTube campaigns? I mean, absolutely, you know, top. 
um, custom affinities, detailed demographic, mid and market, anybody who's engaged with us on YouTube, and then low, right? Like anything from the web, our CRM list, um, throw low likes, similar audiences right there in the mid funnel as well. But yeah, always have a funnel strategy if you have the budget, but that doesn't mean that you can't start today, right? Just doing just simple retargeting, you know, uh, with 10, 15 bucks. Um, and then question eight, you know, is another one that we get all the time. What is the preferred length for a YouTube ad? And I think my response has grown to be the one that I used to get, you know, in school from the, from the English teacher, you know, make it as long as you think to get your point across, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hey, did, you, did you ever get an A for like a one paragraph answer? Never. That's the problem with that, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, it's uh, it's always a tough when things are so subjective, but, you know, if it, it, in my opinion, you know, when it comes to length, shoot for long form. I think the thing that I've seen over the years is people and advertisers are very surprised at how long people watch things on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I think the longer they watch your video, the more you can kind of confirm for yourself that, like, oh, I have something. You know, I have something somebody is willing to watch. So. Yeah. And there's two sides to this coin too, right? I mean, I think when people ask for what is the best length, uh, it's partially about how long do they watch, how well do they engage, and how likely are they to become a customer or have like counted as micro conversion. But I think the other half of that question is a little bit about like, is there a quality score for a video ad? Like, is there a certain point at which Google just says like, this is better? Um, and regardless of what happens on the conversion side, like we actually want to show this more. Because one of the questions before you came in, Corey, was uh, from, uh, I think it was Marco. He was saying that he was running a really successful YouTube campaign and all of a sudden, like, it just stopped, even though he had budget left. Um, mm -hmm. and he couldn't quite figure out what happened. Like, is there a quality score that comes into play? And, like, what does Google want us to do? Um, I'd love to hear you know, Joe's answer to this. But um, when I think about quality score for YouTube, the closest thing that I've ever been able to tie it to is view rate. And like, if you can hit a 45%, 55% view rate, that should correlate to a two cent, one cent cost per view. But when we get view rate in the 60s, that's where it's just one cent cost per views, you know, all, all, all around town. But if we have a view rate that's like 25%, 24%, we're dealing with like seven cents, you know, six to five cents. And so I would look at the view rate as kind of like your determinant if, if you're gonna get, you know, really good value for your video. Because I think the way that YouTube looks at it is that higher the view rate, Lower the cost, lower the view rate. A view rate now, yeah. right? I mean, so say you have a 30 minute video versus a 30 second video, like is the view rate the completion rate or like explain that metric a little sure. bit for us and how we need sure. to do that? Um, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the view rate is based on 30 seconds for anything, for any video longer than 30 seconds. Um, and then if a video is 30 seconds or less, it is based on the completion of that video. Yes, and then there's also, and then you can see your stats get muddled up because if they don't watch for at least 11 seconds, it does not count towards your view. So, it, yeah. So if you're trying to do your ads math, and you're like, these numbers aren't matching up. It's like, ah, if they don't watch 11 seconds of the ad, it does not count towards the view. So that's why your, your six second bumper ads never count towards your video view total. So turn people off from your ads really quickly or if they stay past 11 seconds, make sure they're really engaged. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's complicated again, great. <laughs> they make it fun. Yeah, well, and Joe was making the point, Corey, that uh, you know, first five seconds, really critical. That's when you hook the person and actually compel them to look away from what they were doing, look at the screen, engage with that ad. Um, how, how do you go about making those ads engaging in the first couple of seconds? Uh, we've got so many strategies for you know for the first five seconds as, as well as you know the first thirty. Um, but the first five, we've tested everything from you know quick cuts, um, face to camera, you know works so well, right? Human to human, opening up, directly talking can usually get people to stay. But I think what we love to do is brand, engage, um, um, relay the problem, right? That, that we're trying to solve solve the problem, but then qualify the audience right before 30 seconds. And so what do I mean by qualifying the audience? Um, if you're trying to target females 25 to 34 with one kid, right? if you got to the end of that 30 seconds and maybe between you know 25 to 30, you said, and if you're a mother, you know, right? And so you begin to qualify that audience and really only get 
who you really want past 30 seconds, but you're still able to grant to the entire group you know, prior. Now, what is this going to do? It's going to lower your view rate, right? Because only your core audience is going to be able to make it. But at the same time, it should create a better qualified audience past 30 seconds, which should drive more conversions and a better 30 rate cost. Yeah. That is a great tip. And uh, hey, guys, I can't believe we've done it again, but we've talked for almost an hour. Um, sounds like we could have gone another hour here easily. So maybe both of you need to come back. Part three. Um, <laughs> maybe third time's a charm, right? In terms of the audio <laughs> working for everyone. I think it'll be mine that breaks that time. <laughs> we'll be back. I need, Sorry, I, need this one back. I need this one back. So, uh, Joe and Corey, take us home uh, with maybe a final closing thought from each of you. How do people reach out to you? Um, if there is one thing people need to know, what is that? And then we'll wrap it up. Whoever sure. Wants to be first, Joe. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. You can. There it is. They had it up there. Uh, Twitter, Instagram. I'm at Milwaukee PPC. There's my email. I think you guys were all prepped. I didn't even need to say anything yet. The my. <laughs> Coworker Michelle Morgan and I, we do have a YouTube channel. We have two videos every week. Um, constant content we've, we're seeing paying off. Um, that's a perfect example right there. So there it's youtube.com slash paid media pros. All right. Corey. Hey. Um, yeah, you can always find me on Twitter um, at Corey Hinky. Um, you can also reach out to me, um, variable media, always willing to help answer any questions anybody might have. Um, I think I will leave us with this. Um, I work with a lot of e-commerce clients, and I think you know this year is going to be crazy for e-commerce. And so I think jumping into video, regardless of platform, will be huge because being able to relay how you feel about your product, what it is, explain it, even as a founder or as a small business, um, will be huge. You know, people are going to be at home; they're going to be watching video. And so this is going to be a very interesting, you know, upcoming year for everybody. So thank you for thank you for watching. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, uh, e-commerce huge. So we had a session last week. If people didn't catch that, it's up on our YouTube channel. Uh, one of the best sessions we've done, lots of stats in that one. And Google was sharing that in the last four or five months, e-commerce has grown as much as was it, as it was expected to grow in the next two years. So we're basically already in 2022 as far as the forecast used to be. Um, so crazy, crazy stuff. Kids going back to school, um, I was talking to Joe. His kids are in a hybrid program. My kids are in a hybrid program. Lots of YouTube. Um, and you know what my kid does after the class ends? He starts clicking on different YouTube ads, right? So video is going to explode. It's going to be crazy. Um, so if you need to sell toys, the kids are watching. Um, <laughs> um, and and a, and a note about that, that that session that you did for that e-commerce session was so good. I think uh, I screenshot it, or not screenshot it, sorry. I was watching it, you know, on the TV. And so I was taking, like, pictures with my camera. And, mm -hmm. like, these screenshots, I ended up in decks that I was presenting. And people were asking, like, what's PVC Town Hall? <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> let me show you. Yeah, so I don't tell your friends because this is the best kept secret in the PPC world. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks, guys. It's been fun. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, the next episode we have officially planned is not for a couple of weeks. We're going to have a Q4 e-commerce session, but this time at Microsoft. Uh, but we're hoping to do another one next week uh, on a topic we'll announce very soon. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred.